Okay, let's cover some properties of waves. Okay, we're going to cover a whole bunch of stuff here. Um, the first is reflection. Okay, and we're going to talk about still waves in one dimension. Um, so let's say that we have a chord here, all right, and let's say that the end of this is fixed. Okay, in other words, it's tied or um, firmly attached to some sort of fixed um, point here, like the wall or something like that. And we'll say that this is like a, a slinky or a piece of elastic. So if we are to send a wave pulse into this, I'm going to make it a very specific type of shape to indicate that it has definitely a forward and a back. If we send this in, okay, so in other words, um, the initial velocity of the wave is in this direction, all right? When it collides with the fixed end, um, it will reflect off of here and come back out of this situation, and we'll just draw what that looks like. And what will happen is it will be inverted, so the reflected wave will invert. And so what we'll get is we'll get an inverted wave uh, returning the other way off the fixed end, okay? So it would look like this upon return. Now, this is only from a fixed end, okay? If this were a free end, so instead of being tied or attached here, um, it, you know, that, uh, that rope is free to move. Um, so we'll see if we can draw something that looks like that. Let's put this here. Let's get our pole in place, and we'll say, okay, instead of being attached there, what we've got is we've got a ring or something that can slide or that's capable of sliding up and down, okay? So now we're going to have our input wave, and one thing I want you to notice here is whatever hits first is reflected first, okay? Hence the flat front on the wave. We want to indicate that whatever hits first is what is reflected out first. Because oftentimes there's a tendency to just flip this over and have the pointy end come out. But that doesn't make sense, right? It's what hits first is reflected first. So if we have a free end now, okay, we can draw like this. All right. Okay, so remember, uh, going by the same logic as before, although it's on the same side, okay, uh, although it's on the same side, the part that hit first is the part that comes out first, okay? So this was our wave on the way into the reflection, and this is our wave on its way back out of the reflection, okay? So we call this free end reflection. So why does this happen? Um, okay, so first of all, some of the wave energy obviously is going to go into this hole. No matter how you know rigid this, this connection is, a little bit of energy will get transferred in, okay? Um, and we'll deal with that a little bit more later, especially when we're now attached instead of to a, a pole or a rigid um, fixture, we're attached to another rope and there's some transit that's going on, but that's for in a minute, okay? So for right now, just imagine that the impetus as the wave goes by is to yank this inertia upward, or yank, you know, yank this mass upward. So way it goes in order, in order, in order. So you've got an upward impetus and as we hit this point, there's an upward jerk on it, but the, the, the object can't move, right? The mass can't move. So it's like a Newton's third law scenario, right? You feel there's a jerk upward, but that jerk upward gets flipped and transmitted back in a downward way. And we get the reflection of the wave going back the other way. So it flips it over, but in the opposite way, and that's due to Newton's third law. Whereas here, this is allowed to go through one full oscillation, right? And Essentially, what you're doing is you're starting a new wave pulse because you've run to the end. The energy can't go anywhere else out this way. I mean, a little bit will go into the pole, but not much. You know, you have a full wave pulse. You don't have that Newton's third law. You don't have that fixed end, and that just starts as a new wave aiming out the other way. So here's just a little GIF uh, kind of illustrating that for us, okay? Okay, we're going to talk about transmittance, and transmittance is when some of the wave energy it's transferred into a new medium. So let's imagine now that we have um, some slinky material. And we'll go with a light piece of slinky, and we'll go with a heavier one, okay? 
So the heavier slinky, we're going to assume, has more inertia per given um, bit of length, okay? And therefore, it's going to require um, more force to move it, okay, if you want. So more force to move it. So we have an input wave, and we will draw it. I don't know why that always happens. We'll draw it like um, this, okay? And we'll make a few statements about this, okay? So we've got light to heavy. All right, so we've got light to heavy. The first thing is the velocity here is higher. It's faster here, and it's slower here, okay? Um, you know, I think the easiest way to understand why it would be slower in a heavier medium is just thinking about inertia and the fact that more force is required to accelerate an object that has a higher amount of inertia to it, okay? So F equals MA, all right, with a higher mass to have that, um, you know, object move just requires more force. So we have a limited amount of force. So we have input energy from this side, okay? We have an interface, or if you want, a boundary, okay? And what will happen is, as this wave collides with the boundary, some of the wave energy will be reflected, and some will be transmitted into the new medium, okay? So let's just, uh, let's just draw what will happen after here. Okay, so there's our, there's our boundary. So the first thing is, when light waves, when waves from a light medium encounter um, a heavier medium, the reflection behaves more like a fixed end. So what we'll get is we'll get an inverted wave. Now, it's going to have a lower amplitude than the input wave. Why is that? Because some of its energy has transferred into the new medium. The energy in the new medium will have the same shape, but now we're going slower over here. So some things change about this wave, all right? So the frequency in medium one has to equal the frequency in medium two. This should make sense. However fast, and I just drew one wave pulse, but you can imagine that multiple waves would, could be coming in here and transmitting through into the new medium, okay? And, you know, if you could put like a, you know, some sort of sensor here, you would see the wave fronts hitting or you'd see the, you know, the peaks or the troughs hitting here at some, you know, at some frequency. And it's that frequency that's starting new waves in the new medium, right? It's the same, so we got to have the same frequency from medium one to medium two. Um, okay, so back to this concept, all right? And I just want to make sure that we uh, get a good understanding of what's going on here. So remember, again, in the light, in the light material, you're going to have a faster speed, and in the heavier material, you're going to have a slower speed. And that's got to do with inertia, as we mentioned before. Now, what's important here, and how we can, can think about this and develop a, a formula to kind of describe or help us think about it, is to realize that both frequencies will be the same. So let's go back to um, the wave equation and realize that F frequency always equals, um, sorry, V equals F lambda, all right? So we're going to switch that over and we're going to say F is equal to V over lambda, okay? So F equals V over lambda. So in this case, V1 over lambda 1, 1, thank you, equals V2 over lambda 2, all right? So if the frequencies are the same, then we could say that V1 lambda 1 is equal to V2 lambda 2. Or the ratio of V1 to lambda 1 is the same as the ratio of V2 to lambda 2. Now we're going to do um, a little bit of algebra with this. <clears throat> so essentially we'll cross multiply. We'll see that V1 lambda 2 equals V2 times lambda 1. And then we'll divide off our 1s and 2s and we'll get that V1 over V2 is equal to lambda 1 over lambda 2, all right? In other words, the ratio of the two velocities is the same as the ratios of the two wavelengths, okay? Or in layman's terms, if the frequency is the same and we're slowing down over here, right, the waves are coming more slowly, um, then they have to have a shorter wavelength to maintain the same frequency, right? It's like a train coming along the tracks. If the boxcars go by, you know, five boxcars a second, well, on a slower train to have five boxcars a second, you've got to have shorter boxcars, okay? So you have this kind of important relationship. Um, 
and it's fairly easy to observe in um, strings, you know, a light slinky to a heavy slinky, um, but it also applies to things like light and uh, sound and waves in the ocean. Recording here. Okay, so now we're going to do heavy to light, and we'll draw in a, a wave of odd shape just to make sure we understand what's going on. Okay, so we have our input wave traveling this way, approaching our boundary. All right, what we want to know is after it collides here, what is going to happen? So our prediction, of course, is frequency. Frequencies are equal. Okay, um, if this is slow, and this is fast, the transmitted wave will be traveling faster, and therefore, we're going to end up with a shorter wavelength over here. Okay? And we're coming from a heavy medium to a light medium, so this interface is going to behave more like a free end, so our reflected wave um, will be on the same side. Okay? Whatever part hits the reflection or the interface first is the part that comes out first in the uh, reflected wave. Okay. Okay, so let's take a minute here and let's draw this in. So new wave, uh, or, or I should say transmitted wave, will look very similar, um, but it's going to have a longer wavelength. Okay, and it's likely going to have a lower amplitude. And the reason why, besides energy lost to the environment, um, is the fact that some of that energy got reflected back. Okay, so we go on the same side. This is going to let me on the same side. And whatever went in first is what comes out first. Okay, so I'm going to draw a lower amplitude, but we're going to keep the same wavelength. Okay, so this is the after condition. So before and after our new wave in the uh, transmitted medium continues on, and our reflected wave heads back the way that it came from. Okay, and again, V1 to V2 is lambda 1 to lambda 2. Okay, so we're going to move these wave phenomena into two dimensions. Okay, so now we're no longer restricted um, to our waves being in like a spring or a string. They can be in just, you know, um, a free open space. So we're going to imagine that we have a square pool and we're looking down and this pool is full of water and we can have a what's called point source in the center of the pool. Okay, so this is something like you know, like if you drop some rocks in a pond or something, or a single rock in a pond, that creates a point source, and you'll find that the waves emanate outward from it um, in all directions. Okay, I'm going to try to see if I can make this happen and look nice. I don't know, no guarantees. Come on now. I want to get anyone's like, okay, not too bad, not too bad. Okay, so there's our source, okay, and here's our wave fronts moving out. So we're going to define some new terms here, okay? We're going to call this a wave front. So I like to think of this as like, say, a wave crest, all right? So this is a crest, and this is a crest, and this is a crest. So if that's true, we could then say that our wavelength is defined as the distance between crests, or in this picture, um, the distance between adjacent wave fronts. So we would call that our wavelength. Okay, we're going to define a new term here, and that's called the wave ray. So wave ray is always drawn perpendicular to wave fronts, and it will show the direction of wave travel. Okay, so we'll draw some wave rays in here. Ray, 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 etc., etc., etc. Okay. So something you'll notice is that these are always perpendicular to the fronts. Okay. So you can come in here and you can draw a little 90 degree symbol like that. Okay. Now these are called circular waves. Um, Imagine that, okay? And they are waves in two dimensions, okay? That's not the only type of wave in two dimension because you can also create parallel waves, okay? Um, or linear waves if you want, 
So this would be if instead of having a source of waves that is a single point in the middle, oops, I would like a square. A single point in the middle, you now you now have a, a source of waves that is uh, linear itself. Okay, so we can draw that as well. It's pretty straightforward. So let's imagine um, in our pool that we have like a, a long piece of two by four, and we put it here, and we start to like you know move it up and down or oscillate it back and forth. What you'll find is you'll get a whole bunch of waves emanating out that are all beside each other. Okay. So when you go to the beach and you see sets of waves coming in towards the shore, they're often of this type. They're often parallel waves. Okay. So we can still have these wave rays drawn in here. It's just like now they'll look like that. And I'd like it to be an arrow, please. It's got a wave ray, wave ray, and a wave ray. Okay. And I'll just uh, we'll write a note that those are called wave rays, just so we all know. Okay, it's a wave ray, and here are wave rays as well. Okay, and we call these plane, parallel, or if you want, even linear waves. Just to add to this, okay, here's our wavelength, right? It's between two wave fronts. So here's our fronts here. And our source, our source is linear. Okay. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce Huyfen's law here. Um, so Huyfen's was a Dutch um, physicist, I guess you could call him, um, a contemporary of Isaac Newton and a pretty famous waves uh, researcher. He was a proponent of the wave theory of light versus the corpuscular or particle theory um, back in the day, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But Huygens, which looks like Huygens, um, proposed that um, all points on a front can serve as a source of new waves. That'll become important later on. All right, and that means something for if instead of just having a, a pool of equal depth, we now have an area that's say shallower. Well, that's going to behave like a new uh, medium, okay? And the waves are going to actually transmit over into the new medium. All right, so on transmittance into the new medium, we get the same kind of relationship uh, that we got when we were dealing with waves in one dimension, all right? So if this is a, a shallower area, like a reef or something, you know, if you're into surfing or whatever, okay, um, the waves will, you know, slow down in the shallower water, and therefore their wavelengths will shorten, okay? This is quite obvious if you've ever gone from deep water in a boat to shallow water near the shore. Um, the wavelengths out in the deep water are quite a bit longer often. Um, than they are in the shallower water, right? Okay, so the, the last little part here I want to talk about is just exactly this. What happens if instead of hitting um, this surface perfectly um, perpendicularly, you hit at an angle? Um, so before we do that, let's just talk about wave rays and how we reflect when we're in two dimensions. So let's imagine that we have a surface here and we have some waves striking the surface first like this. So let's just talk about the reflection that's going to happen here. So the first thing is um, the normal that we used in physics before is, is back. Okay, so the normal is back. So where we have a wave striking a surface, we are going to put ourselves a normal line. Okay, now this normal line is just drawn perpendicular to the surface. And it's an aid. It's a, it's a geometrical aid. So we draw the normal in, and it's going to help us to understand some stuff now. So I want to talk about, let's imagine that this is um, a wave striking a boundary, and we have total reflection. There's no transmittance at this point. The wave is just reflecting off of here. What you will find is there's a law that states that, uh oh, I don't like that. I want to go back to my arrow, that uh, the reflected wave 
will have the same angle as measured from the normal as the incident wave did. Okay, so we're going to write that down. So we're going to call this theta 1. We're going to call this theta 2. Or you might call them theta i as in incident and theta r as in reflected. Okay, um, so the law of reflection just simply states this. It's pretty easy to remember. It's just that theta 1 equals theta 2. Always measured from the normal. The normal. Okay. All right. So we have that. That's the law of reflection. Now, what about transmittance? Because we noticed in 1D, we had some reflection and some transmittance. And you can see this with water. You can see your reflection in water, but you can also kind of see into water. Okay. Um, so although we're not talking yet about light, um, light will very soon be a part of this, okay? So we, we, we notice in our demonstration that as the wave entered the slower medium, if it entered at an angle, there was a direction change. And this direction change is called refraction. So now what we have here is we have deep water on this side. We have shallow water on this side. Or better yet, you have a fast medium and you have a slow medium, okay? So we're going to draw in our normal. The normal will always be a part of this, okay? So let's put our normal in here. What? That's what I want. I want a dotted straight line. Oh, man. Come on, I could do this. There it is. Okay, so there's our normal. Now we want an input wave ray. So remember, right, we've got the wave ray, but along the wave ray, we have all of our wave fronts, right? We're going to consider them to be parallel at this point. Okay, are you with me? Actually, let's make them a little bit longer. So as we met, enter the slower medium, what is going to happen to our wavelength? Shorter or longer? Shorter. Not only that, we're going to have a bending towards what's called the normal, right? Bending towards the normal. So when waves enter a slower medium, they bend towards the normal. Okay. So I'm going to write a couple things in here. <laughs> Jeez. It remembers what I did before. Struggling here, guys. Okay. There we go. Now we got theta 2. So we're not talking about refraction, or sorry, reflection now. Now we're talking about refraction. Theta 1 equals angle of incidence. And theta 2 is the angle of refraction. Okay. And so we've got a V1, we've got a V2, and we also notice we've got a lambda 1, we've got a lambda 2, and now we've got a theta 1 and a theta 2. I feel like I should have done those in a different color. This doesn't really matter. And well, it turns out, just because I'm going to run out of time, that V1 over V2 equals lambda 1 over lambda 2 equals sine theta 1 over sine of theta 2. Okay? So we're going to end up with shorter wavelengths over here. And just to finish up, um, I want to draw those in and just see how essentially the wavelength has to shorten up. And I don't want it to be that. I want it to be this. So there's the wave striking the surface. Here's our new wave wavelength looking like this. Okay. So what has to be going on, right, is these waves are, are parallel, or I should say perpendicular to the new line, right? You'll notice the parts that hit first get slowed down first, right? So these get slowed down before the rest of the wave gets slowed down. So it's now going slower here, but the rest is going faster. And hence, you end up with this turning of the wave. It's as if you say rolled a wheel and axle from pavement onto grass. This wheel on the, well, from that perspective, on the right side hits the grass before the one on the left, if we're going in its direction. And it's going to turn itself 
over. 